I have loved Supergiant Games' games ever since playing through Bastion at the end of 2012. And with their newest creation Hades, Supergiant absolutely knocked it out of the park and into the streets of a different planet inhabited by another slightly less developed baseball playing civilization, where it was immediately run over by a 1969 Ford Mustang, the supreme car choice of their time. Where was I? Oh yeah, Hades. It's fast, it's fun, it's beautiful, it's a god dating sim, which is really the only respectable way of making a game about Greek mythology if you ask me. Hades is the story of Hades, son, Zagreus, attempting to leave the underworld to which he is bound, while his father, the literal god of the dead, does just enough to look like he's trying to stop Zag without actually stopping him. It's got all the family drama you'd expect from anything involving Greek gods, but at the same time Hades is really just another quirky sitcom about a stressed out, middle-aged suburban father who doesn't know how to deal with his son's rebellious face. Keep it down, I say. There's the understanding mom who constantly argues with dad, the helpful uncle, the annoying kid brother, and the duty-bound older sister you keep getting into fights with. Oh, and of course the three-headed hellhound you'd expect in any self-respecting American sitcom. But we know none of this yet when starting the game as it just throws us directly into our first escape attempt. No time is wasted on annoying exposition, but instead on making the player familiar with the actual game. The story can be uncovered later. What's important right now is this. We have a weapon and are making our way through the randomized structures of the underworld. You know, the place where all the evil dead people go to suffer for eternity. Anyways, for some reason the folks down here seem to be rather upset. Like one of their lost souls for eternity friends came over, used up all the toilet paper and didn't bother to refill it. And believe it or not, this carnage is sponsored by the Olympian gods themselves. No, not the soul toilet carnage. The carnage of the underworld's angry inhabitants. The people are gross. Anyway. Somehow the gods are quite happy to hear about their long lost relative and want to meet him. That's why, in trying to help Zag escape, they bestow their boons upon his face. Each Olympian gives out a different set of boons focused on their domain. Poseidon does water stuff, Athena does protection stuff, Aphrodite does sexy stuff. The boons are unique, but still follow a structure, so that you can for example buff your regular attack through boons from any one of them. They can also synergize, so creative minds can really do some creative things by being creative here. Well, only if their creative bodies can keep them alive long enough to see them come to fruition. Because if there's one thing I know about roguelikes, it's that death is inevitable. Getting through all four areas of randomly generated rooms, and equally randomly generated mini-bosses, and finally the selectively random bosses at the end of each area won't be an easy task. Even for someone blessed by the literal god of male people. Another thing we know about roguelikes is that they continuously need to mix things up to keep players engaged. After all, it's in their nature to make players do exactly the same thing over and over again from the beginning to the end. You're not exploring vast cities, dark caves, lush forests or empty planets. You're going through the basement, or the castle, or Tartarus. Again, and again, and again, and again, and again. How do we not get bored of that? Firstly, obviously the gameplay needs to be fun. Which it is. I mean, have you seen the footage? But let's still talk about it. Hades is like the ultimate amalgamation of Supergiants' previous works. Aesthetically, it reminds me very much of Transistor. The room architecture, the character models and the slickness of it all. It's also very reminiscent of Bastion in that the combat is action-packed, precise and feels very rewarding, but does it even better still. We get different weapons which all feel distinct and realistic in how they play. Long-range sniping with a bow, close-up boxing with the gloves or poking these fat blobby things with a stick. Hades has got it all. Choosing a particular weapon for a run doesn't pigeonhole the player into a specific playstyle though, since there are multiple ways to attack and play. Every weapon has different moves, a regular attack, a special attack, and they can usually be combined with the dash. If you aren't happy with those, there's always the universal cast to fall back on, and once you get better at the game you'll find yourself utilizing all of these in unison. Add the multitude of different boons, and the player can really customize their experience with any given weapon while still keeping the unique feeling of that tool intact. It might have become obvious by now, but Hades is extremely skill intensive, and has a high skill ceiling. Even on your very first run you can beat the game, given you are much better than at least I am. 
Nothing is locked behind any arbitrary walls. And even though you can upgrade Zagreus, it never becomes a plain number comparison game like you would see in RPGs. Narratively, it also very much feels like a super giant games game to me. Most notably because of yet another sassy narrator who sounds like the personification of a packet of cigarettes. The set of weights, positioned carefully in line of sight of any visitors, shall doubtless make them think the prince is stronger and in better shape than in reality. I get lots of exercise, okay? Speaking of which, this game is fully voiced and the cast is absolutely brilliant. Especially Darren Corp's portrayal of a British son of the God of the Dead stood out to me among others. And speaking of Darren Corp, he again worked as the composer of the game and, much like with their other games, the soundtrack is positively headbang inducing. Corp's composing style comes through in each of their titles and makes fans of the studio feel right at home. Doesn't matter that it's the rundown house of literally Hades. Turn up the volume and you immediately feel like one of the dastardly dev- Wait, this is my chance for a narrator impression. Feel like one of the- <clears throat> Dastardly devious denizens of the house. Eh, I'll make that sound better in post. The music gets you hyped for the game. The amazing but challenging combat keeps every fight hype and when this culminates in boss fights against some of your favorite characters, please no, better. When all of this comes together, your hype level skyrockets out of the stratosphere. It takes a pit stop on the moon, but when I say pit stop, I actually mean fights of an army of galactic invaders on the moon. Cause this is Hades, and this underworld lava barge does not have any anchors. Except for when you finally win, and the music ends perfectly timed to the boss's death and the feeling of accomplishment is insane. And while this excitement is going on, another figure familiar to Supergiant fans might make her appearance. While Ashley Barrett's voice is a little harder to find this time around, when you finally do, it's beautiful. Mesmerizing even. The footage you can see right now is me hearing her character sing for the first time. Look at this fool. I'm supposed to be cleaning up the number twoing lost souls and hitting the Hydra on the head. It's... Yet I just sit there and listen, appreciating the moment of respite. <laughs> I love this game. Just play it. Here's one thing I've never seen a roguelike do to this extent. Each run has a higher purpose than just itself. There's other stuff to do and see outside of the quote-unquote game, meaning the escape attempts. Throughout the underworld, Zagreus can find a number of meta resources, which can be used after a run in Hades' house. The purple crystals can be exchanged for certain buffs. These gems are used to build things and keys unlock new weapons. With this, Zagreus can gain access to new powers, or just become stronger in general, which will make future runs easier. So no matter how much you might struggle with the game, no run ever feels like a waste of time, since you can always get something out of it. Most other roguelikes generally make the player start every attempt at zero, and use the increase in player skill as the sole form of leveling up. These games also rarely have an in-lore explanation as to why the player can keep trying, even after dying. Oftentimes it's just glossed over and accepted by players. To be clear, I don't think that that is a bad thing at all, but doing so lets Hades get away with sensible character progression. Zagreus literally dies, yes, but since he's a god, death doesn't end his life, as weird as that sounds. He gets to keep going. We don't just cut to black and tell the same story again like in Isaac, but it's one continuous story. As a result, Zagreus gets stronger and uses resources he finds on the way, because of course he would. But the growth is not just limited to Zagreus. The world also keeps going instead of looping back to the start again. Hades gains breathing room and can tell stories not just limited to that one playthrough. Characters interact and change their views and grow. Sure, Rogue Legacy for example had permanent upgrades and a lore explanation for deaths, but what other roguelike has ever done this much? Every time Zack gets back to the house one way or another, we can have conversations with the house's denizens or listen to discussions between them. Like this, the game tells certain stories and you see Zack getting closer to them over time. Another meta resource, Nectar, can be gifted to characters to gain their keepsakes for future use and also strengthen your bonds with them. You give them gifts and gain hearts and improve your relationships. It's a dating sim. Just not like Dream Daddy, a dad dating simulator. And more like Doki Doki, since you can't actually get anywhere with most characters, no matter what you do it ends in death and every path leads back to... Whoa. Megara. It always leads to Megara. 
The characters are super likable, interesting, charming, and I really enjoyed getting to know them better. The Hub House does a great job of offering the player some time to rest, is filled with many possible activities, but also gives them even more things to work toward. And speaking of which, what else keeps us playing? What drives people? Well, behaviorist psychology can get a couple mice to run through a labyrinth for some cheese. And they figure people can be cheese like that too. So, how does Hades reward players and awaken their inner achievers so that they run through more labyrinths? Well, here are some of the things players can work towards. The house contractor allows for renovations of the home to make it prettier, players can buy music to listen to on demand, or, and this is the biggest one, players can change things about the underworld itself. Anything Zagreus buys here will have lasting consequences and affect future attempts. Imagine this, you've had a terrible couple rooms and are barely holding on for dear life. Stressed out and desperate, you enter the next chamber almost ready to give up, and then you hear the calming sounds of water nearby. A fountain chamber. A place with nothing to fight, only to heal and relax. And what makes this especially rewarding is that you made it possible. You decided to use up your resources on adding these rooms to the pool of potential encounters. Other possible orders may add gold-filled vases all around the underworld, or fill infernal troves, which are timed fighting gauntlets with more loot. Like I mentioned, in Hades you can get closer to the underworld's important characters, and by getting closer I mean gaining more hearts. This unlocks their keepsakes, which provide extra help on attempts. But that is not all these hearts are good for. They also play a role in several side quests and character arcs. Here's an example. In the house you have this lone music stand and sometimes hear talk of a court musician who lost his muse, refused to sing and was put in solitary confinement. If intrigued, you might revoke this sentence using, again, your resources to pay the house contractor. With this Orpheus comes back. He still doesn't want to sing though. But he's a really nice chap, so maybe you might want to help him further. Oh, remember that lone cottage and the mesmerizing singer Eurid... Eurid... Terry Treehead? Maybe there's a connection between the two, and maybe there's a way to bring the two back together. I mean, of course there's a connection, of course there's a way. It's an achievement for Zeus's sake. A good one, by the way, that doesn't just tell you what to do. Don't worry though, it's not hard to figure out. Just be aware and help your mate. Mate. Anyways, there are a lot more things to explore with the game's characters and their stories, which is very motivating. And some might even lead to some lovey-dovey action. Ever wanted to get some action with Charon, the ferryman of the underworld? Well, too bad, seems like it doesn't swing that way. And believe me, I tried. I don't worry about it, mate. Whatever floats your boat, you know. The best part about all of these quests for unrequited Charon love is that it is up to the player to choose whether or not to engage with them. And if they do and end up heartbroken because they can't get into his boat, they just settle for Mag. See, like I said, in the end it all leads back to... <sighs> Zeus, damn it. Weapons! The Infernal Arms also provide players with cheese to chase after. And much like a lot of the achievables in this game, they come in waves instead of all at once. First, your goal is to learn to use the few weapons you possess and gradually unlock the rest with keys. Then you are trying to master them and beat the game with each. At the same time, weapon aspects will become available, which are slightly modified versions of each infernal arm. Lore-wise, they represent the unique characteristics of the weapon's previous wielders throughout history, such as Achilles, Gilgamesh, or some random bloke named Arthur. Each weapon has four different aspects that can each be upgraded further, giving players even more options and things to work towards. It's also worth mentioning that all of these aspects introduce new challenges and can promote or even force players into different gameplay styles than they might be used to. One example would be Guan Yu's version of the Spear, which sacrifices a substantial amount of max health and health regeneration in exchange for power. These new options make players think, and even better, rethink what they thought they knew. A concept also to be found with the Mirror of the Night. Here the player can make use of all their hard-earned purple crystals to upgrade the mirror's boons. These, again, are unlocked in waves and again through the use of keys. This makes them very valuable unlocking tools in the early game and players will have to carefully consider what they want to spend them on. But before we get to the effects of the mirror, I want to quickly talk about the other side of the meta resources. 
because even though they might have their uses during certain stages of the game, this won't last forever. At some point, players will have done all they can with them, and since their only function is outside of the game, acquiring them in a run will feel much worse. Or what if I as a player simply don't care about the things outside of the game? Or have runs where I would much rather gain strength instead of investing in the future by choosing meta resources? To illustrate, let's consider these examples, assuming meta resources to be of no value to the player. Here there's only one real option left, so all the work put in to give players meaningful choices would have been for naught. And here the player just feels bad because none of the rewards help them. This is just hypothetically speaking, of course, since luckily Supergiant attended to this problem in numerous ways. First, let's address the possibility of them becoming useless outside of runs. The Wretched Broker in the house gives Zagreus some options on trading resources for others, which might be more useful at the moment. Then there's also the rank advancement system, which gives players the ability to unlock fancy and quite costly badges. Or the player might try to buy the also very expensive new UI themes from the contractor. Naturally, some players will eventually deplete even these options, but that is fine. Everything has to end somewhere. It's a good thing that we also have the other solutions then, huh? So let's look at the problem of meta resources not being helpful in runs. Well, it's pretty straightforward, really. The house contractor allows for upgrades to add some beneficial bonuses when picking them up during an attempt. Keys give one more reroll, darkness slightly increases max health, and gems also come with some gold. Also, since all the side effects are different, there's still decision making involved even when deciding between one of them. And with the ability Dark Foresight, players can use the Mirror of Night to receive a boost to the likelihood of finding other more impactful chamber rewards. Or in other words, to find meta resources less often. But again, it's up to the player to make that decision, depending on how they want to play. This principle also goes for most of the other mirror buffs, which are almost never just boring stat upgrades. And if they do increase Zagreus's, let's say, damage output, they might only do so when attacking foes from behind or when they're affected by multiple harmful conditions. One early fear of mine was that because these abilities will likely always be active, players could end up always playing the same way. Maybe they hyper-focus on attacking foes from behind, and never try builds that don't work well with the idea. Luckily, there are two sides to a mirror, and each buff has a different version players can use. Most of the time, they offer quite similar things, but in different ways. For example, getting 100 gold at the start of a run, or gradually getting money the more gold the player has saved up. Again, the game makes players think about how they want to play, and then allows them to adjust their Zagreus accordingly. This can be done flexibly for every run, since all the darkness can be reset and reallocated with just a single key. When it comes to things to work toward, we still haven't talked about the Theseus in the room. The main plot. Which I don't really want to spoil. Just know this, considering roguelikes are normally rather... story light, Hades probably boasts the best narrative of its peer group. The conclusion that comes with seeing the credits for the first time being a standout example of the game's writing chops. It's especially rewarding when after all the hardships they went through together, things finally start working out for Zagreus and the player, and others begin treating them with more respect. It feels... earned. After all, they kept trying and honed their skills through countless attempts that ultimately mostly led to failure. And I just want to mention that not just the main story, but everything in this game is advanced by playing the game. Side quests, storylines, the unlocking of weapons and aspects, upgrading them and getting stronger, all of it requires the player to play the game and creates a very solid gameplay loop. Everything is designed to make you want to keep playing the game. So, the game is great and there's so much to do and see and all of it loops back around to playing the game more. But what if I get bored of it still? After all, I'm just doing the same thing over and over again. Well, this is where one of Roguelike's most important design elements kicks in. Variants. Variants means that every run will be different and as a result every experience will be unique. Random dungeon layouts, random enemies, random mini-bosses, random items, random shops. All of these genre classics are meant to increase variance. And again, this is vital because some players might get stuck and not make it through a particular area for a long time, or they might beat the game and thus have theoretically seen everything. 
Hades combats this by adding even more stuff, but gradually, so that players can't burn through all the content too quickly and feel like there's always something new or different. Here's a list. As you progress through the story, new enemies will be unlocked for the different areas, such as Ringers and Tartarus. Not only that though, even a new Olympian god appears only after seeing the Winter Wonderland that is the surface for the first time. Drumroll please, it's Santa baby! Demeter. Boss fights are slightly different each run. Theseus, for example, is always assisted by a random god that isn't currently helping Zagreus. The Hydra can come in four variants with different attacks, which are unlocked after beating it three times. And Megara is, well, replaced by her sisters. After some attempts, Electo and Tisiphone can start appearing as the boss for Tartarus, bringing with them a similar experience, but still a slightly different fight as a whole. Not only is this integrated into the lore, but it's also a very smart decision to keep players engaged. The very first area of the game is the one players are obviously going to be seeing the most of, and at the same time, as it is the easiest, will be the first one players will start outgrowing with their increasing skills. Thus, it's vitally important to provide a lot of variants for Tartarus. And having three different characters as possible boss encounters helps players hold out until some of the other customization options start to kick in. Playing the Fury Roulette with Zag, where we guess who's going to be up next, is also quite fun. Although we both really only want to see Mag anyways. Our Crimea River sticks Electo and let Karen take you to a place where I care. And then we also have all the other random things that can pop up in a run. Here's another list. Some of these will be unlocked later, or help with gradually uncovering certain character side stories. Don't worry, this won't be on the test. I'm just trying to illustrate that there is a lot to Hades. The other side of the customization coin is the one the player is in control of, and this is where the game really shines. Players can customize their experience by choosing their weapon and weapon aspect, their keepsake, their companion, the rooms they want to enter, or the boons they prefer out of a given three. Hades incorporates choices everywhere other roguelikes might only present the one. The perfect mirror traits can flexibly be chosen, and players can freely decide whether or not they want to engage with the game's plot, its characters, and their stories, or even with which characters in particular. Most of this I already talked about in other places, but this only goes to show how interconnected Hades' design is and how much focus lies on creating player agency. But the one thing I have yet to explain is this, the heat or pact system. Pacts of punishment allow players to self-regulate certain aspects of the underworld. Generally, it's a way to increase the game's difficulty to near impossible levels while being extremely versatile. These are the conditions the player can choose from. We get a lot. Some make enemies beefier, more powerful, traps more dangerous, or add a timer to the attempt. Then there are some big ones, such as extreme measures, which makes the game's main bosses more devious. I don't want to spoil the later ones too much, so let's focus on the first two. In case of the Diabolical Dames, Extreme Measures, or EM for short, makes it so you have to fight all of them. Kind of. One is still chosen randomly as the main opponent, while the others may help out with some of the signature attacks. It's chaotic, punishing, but also a chance for the trio to finally talk things out and make up. Good for them. The Hydra itself doesn't change much. Here it's the environment that's gotten an overhaul. See the difference? Good. And now just imagine even more complex changes to the other bosses. Before every run, the player can choose to toggle these conditions on or off, or adjust the level of some. Each chosen condition adds a certain amount of heat relative to how impactful it is. And then the accumulated heat from all accepted conditions can be used to judge how challenging any given run generally will be. In other words, the more heat, the more difficult the game. With each new level of heat the player beats, good rewards like diamonds or titan blood can be received. If players want to keep getting these, they will have to crank up the heat more and more, which means they will have to learn about how to deal with each new pact. They're forced to adapt and get better. And as always, they are made to do so with all of the weapons, because the rewards are specific to the used infernal arm. To get their hands on as much cheese as possible, they're incentivized to play more than just their best weapons and instead gain mastery of them all. And even if we were to overlook all of this, the heat system could still hold its own. 
It's an ingenious way to adjust the game's difficulty to the player's specific needs. And since there are so many different options to choose from, players can experiment a lot and create their own kinds of challenges. All of this only works because the game is so great to begin with, but the Pact of Punishment really pushes Hades mid to end game to another level entirely. Here's another thing that impressed me, which is the attention to detail Hades shows not just in its level or combat design, but when it comes to the world. It really does feel like a real world, and that's because seemingly everything can react to very specific things the player or NPCs might do. It must have been a lot of work to build this level of continuity, so let's honor some examples. Hypnos, who is in charge of recording the details of death and other information of all the souls entering the underworld, knows exactly how Zagreus died. He will comment on the place of death or the type of enemy that did the player in, and give some hints as to how to deal with it next time. When still fighting to escape the underworld for the first time, Zagreus will mention when he has reached a floor he's never been to before. Or in other words, he'll inform the player of a new personal best. Bosses that defeated Zagreus will not be in the house when he returns via the river Styx, because you arrived immediately but they are all still back where they vanquished him. Gods often comment on some of the other gods that have bestowed boons upon Zag in a run, mostly through more or less thinly veiled quips. Zagreus talks about the happenings in the world with other people just as other people talk about them amongst themselves. You know, like people would makes it feel like the other characters have their own lives and problems to worry about and the whole underworld doesn't just revolve around us. All the side quests and problems you can help people with support this as well. Zag once mentioned how weird it is that I used Ares' call specifically fighting against him in a trial. Poseidon commented on me having beaten the bull and Ares and Athena both hinted at deaths near the gate of the underworld, acknowledging my recent achievements. People react to the different weapons and aspects the player may be using or treat Zag differently depending on story progress or relationship level or even random items like Theseus being angry about me owning the yarn of Ariadne, whoever that is. Or what about the more humorous bits of continuity? Since Daddy continuously ends up burning his capes but still is always wearing one, Zagreus jokes about his closet consisting only of capes. When we finally gain access to Hades' room, this is what we find. I knew it, it's just capes. After countless banter sessions with the Bone Hydra, which sadly doesn't seem intelligent enough to feel irritated by any of them, Zagreus decides to dub it Lerny, and thus after that the Bone Hydra will always be named Lerny, literally everywhere. Most of these things alone aren't overly complex or mind-boggling. Adding a few conditional voice lines here and there shouldn't be too hard, or changing a name of one enemy, or reacting to one specific weapon. But these things stack. The more you focus on details like this, the more effort and attention is required to not only create them, but to also make sure that nothing contradicts or works against something else. But if done correctly, genuine effort and heart create a genuine feeling experience. The world of Hades is one. So we've talked about the gameplay, the narrative, the systems keeping players engaged, but there's one integral part we haven't discussed yet. Zagreus. Zagreus is a great character for us to relate to, and that's because we're god gamers. And that's because with his immortality, he can be calm in very stressful and life-threatening situations. Not entirely dissimilar to players, who can also feel calm even though their avatars may be in very stressful and life-threatening situations. He's a great friend toward his mates, respectful toward the people helping him, or pretty much anyone who has done him no wrong. But he also calls people out on their hysteria shit, and makes snarky sarcastic comments. He's a greatly appreciated source of calmness, levity, and quite frankly, sass. And since he's likable, interesting, and relatable, players will automatically get invested in his story and his goals. This is way more important to get people engaged in a narrative than any amount of useless fabricated drama or stakes or explosions. He's great. Mate. Wait. All of this greatness would not have been possible with a less caring developer. 
The amount of detail to this game, like when Orpheus and Terry finally get to meet again and they're singing together the same song they have each already sung alone. And now together they harmonize effortlessly and when you talk to Eurydice, sorry Terry, she stops singing but Orpheus continues until she joins in perfectly again after her conversation with Zagreus. Or the sheer endless amount of very specific dialogue, like when Thanatos chastises Zack for meddling in other people's business, when neither of the singers asked him to, after which the next conversations with Orpheus and Eurydice, Zagreus feels guilty and apologizes for it, and then the next time we meet Thanatos, he tells us that he's sorry for being so harsh on his friend. I can't imagine detail like this in any other game, really. So what did they do that others don't? Well, apart from the dialogue system they used and the insane size of the script, it was the team's transparency and ability to ask the right questions and listen that made it possible. Hades was in early access for a while, during which Supergiant made sure to incorporate as much feedback as possible. Something didn't make sense? Well, leave it to players to somehow find even the tiniest mistakes. And Supergiant listened. This openness can be seen wherever you look. Really, throw a stone in a random direction and I guarantee you'll hit a developer quizzing a random passerby about their thoughts on the game. And being the all-around sympathetic people that they are, I'm sure that after politely ending their current chat, they'll be right with you. Give back the rock, apologize for standing in its way and ask about how it felt to throw it and if the experience could be improved somehow. At the same time, they are also extremely transparent. Want to know more about everything Hades? Well, for starters, consider checking out one of the multiple dev streams, the series of documentaries on the NoClub YouTube channel, these tweets about the game's level design, or the official Supergiant Discord. These two things make them come across as one of the most genuine video game developers I have ever seen, and I have nothing but the utmost respect for their work. So play it. Play this weird mishmash of genres and Greek mythology. Play it in Hell Mode if you don't enjoy not dying every 10 seconds in your games. Play it in God Mode if you're really bad at the part where you have to press the buttons and just want to see the story unfold. Or play it in Normal Mode if you're a normie. Doesn't matter. Just play it. This is hard.